Polish Space Agency, of course, Mr. Olson. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. The chair recognizes Mr. Waltz. Hopefully the Floridian won't cause quite as many problems as our Texan over here. Well, I do have to say, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, we've heard a lot about Alabama as the, um, as the home of space and, and the Republic of Texas, but I think we all know where space DNA really resides, which is in Florida, and, and excited to celebrate the 50th anniversary of, uh, of Apollo 11 coming up. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of discussion today uh, around the international aspects of, uh, of the ISS. I am very focused also as a member of uh, the Armed Services Committee on what the Chinese uh, in particular are doing in space. Uh, I think it is always worth remembering and reminding that the, the Chinese military is behind every component, major component of what the Chinese are doing in space, whether that's in their new space station or if they uh, have manned research station on the moon. I put research in, in air quotes uh, on the moon. And that basically everything that NASA has, has done going forward or, or looking backwards uh, has not been in the same type of competitive and, and potentially hostile environment that we will look at going, going forward. So I think we all agree that American and NASA leadership in space must continue. Uh, we must maintain a low Earth orbit. Please interject if you disagree that we must maintain LEO uh, and we must maintain a presence, and particularly if it's a competitive space uh, going forward. But the disconnect seems like the white elephant in the room is whether this plan will actually work with commercialization, whether it will work in the timeline. And I'm hearing, um, I'm hearing from the Inspector General that some skepticism, is that fair to say that the plan will actually work to be able to take on that O&M budget of operating the space station uh, in the timeline proposed? Skepticism is in an Inspector General's job description. Sure, I know it's built in. Uh, it is, it's a real concern. The $1.2 billion operation and maintenance annual cost of maintaining station. Right. Correct. So, so President Reagan put forward a plan, what, approximately 10 years in advance. Uh, what is NASA's, I mean, what is NASA's plan B? I've heard, I've heard you ask, when are we going to see that plan B that if the figures don't work and the private sector can't take it on, when are we, when are, when, what's the decision point to extend beyond 2024? And then what's the, what's the decision point to extend beyond 2028 or to have a new vehicle or to have a new platform in place? Mr. Gersmeyer. We have some time to decide for the new platform in place. That's not an immediate problem. I think we need to... What, what is the time, right? Is it six years? Then, If it's not 10, then is it five years, six years? What is, as you're look, in the military we forecast, right, what's that decision point? It's probably about six years out or so. So that would be probably 20, 30 kind of lifetime, and then back that up six years. Assuming the four-year extension? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and so, but but I think the more important thing is we need some stability and understanding for the commercial sector so they can plan. I think it's also probably not appropriate to assume that the private sector is going to take over all the costs of the capability we have in low Earth orbit. But we can reduce that cost by using the private sector where we're now, we're not the only um, agency taking people to space. The private sector is doing that on their own through private astronaut missions, et cetera. So we're one of many customers. That reduces our costs some amount. How much we reduce that cost is is important to us. We don't. I don't think we can predict that, but we need to try to drive to that situation. What okay. we need to avoid is we need to avoid the gap that was discussed here, especially in light of the Chinese space station, which could be in orbit, a portion of it, even as early as this year or next year. Um, we need to make sure that we don't create a gap where we, the U.S., don't have a facility in low orbit, and there's only the Chinese. Absolutely, 100% agree. Mr. Stalmer, uh, in the time I have remaining, the FAA, switching tracks here, the FAA recently released a notice of proposed, proposed rulemaking regarding regulatory reform for launch and reentry of commercial vehicles. Obviously, launch is critical to everything we've discussed today. Uh, with projections of getting up to 50 plus flights by 2021. What are your thoughts on how industry views the draft rules that are out? What needs to be addressed moving forward uh, to enable American companies and private sectors to operate efficiently? 
That's a great question. Uh, in short, we, we, we have concerns. We have concerns. Uh, there's a directive put out that we're going to streamline you know, the regulatory um, burden that a lot of the industry is facing. And I, I say a burden, it, it's, it's a burden because it hasn't been updated. Um, the, what the launch industry was back in, in the mid-'80s is different from what the launch industry is today in, in 2019. Uh, there's more commercial uh, launch vehicles than ever. We have, uh, just for NASA alone, four vehicles you know, that will be servicing um, the, the space station uh, with reusability. So these issues need to be addressed, and I think um, with this rulemaking process, I think the FAA really needs to hear, um, especially the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, really needs to hear what industry has to say on how their industry is being regulated. Um, it has to. It can't be so. It has to be performance based rather than so prescriptive based. Um.